All right, so I think this is our sixth week doing the Christian Basics class. And what we, in the last couple of weeks, just to review to show you where we are, is that in John 6, 63, uh, and I wrote that on the board here, uh, that Jesus' words to you are spirit and life. He says there in John 6, verse 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And Romans 8.2 tells us that Romans 8.2 says that we are to live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And so once you have recognized your sin and trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, uh, then what we should do is be living by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And we do that by going, according to John 6, 63, we go by the words that Jesus speaks unto you, unto us. They are spirit and they are life. And so what we're going to do, though, is we understand that Jesus did not directly speak every word of the Bible directly to us today. Uh, John 1, 1 says that Jesus is the word. I think a lot of times when people look at their Bibles they think, well, the red letters are the most important because that's Jesus speaking um, to us. But really, uh, John 1, 1 says that Jesus is the Word, which means that all of the Bible is really Jesus speaking. But we know that we can't follow it all at the same time. So, for example, we, we mentioned this, that in Genesis 6, God tells Noah to build an ark. So the way that Noah was saved was by building an ark. He tells Peter, or Peter through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2.38 says that they are to be saved by repenting and be water baptized. We know from Genesis 15, 4 through 6, that Abraham, God told Abraham, believe that your seed will be as numerous as the stars in heaven. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So right there, there's four different gospels. Genesis 6, build an ark in order to be saved. Genesis 15, Believe that God will make your seed as numerous as the stars in heaven. Uh, Acts 2.38, uh, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. 1 Corinthians 15.3-4, trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. Now, I said that uh, the 1 Corinthians 15.3-4 passage is the one that saves us. But, you know, since we, we really need to understand which one it is, because that's going to determine uh, where we live for all eternity. So we're spending a great deal of time understanding that the whole Bible is the Word of God, that that's Jesus speaking, but it is only the words that Jesus speaks directly to us that are spirit and they are life. And so what we're going to do tonight is try to show you the differences here uh, when, when Jesus, since He is the Word, to figure out, you know, when is He speaking to us and, and so we know which ones are words that we directly follow and which part of the other Bible while we... Uh, the other parts of Scripture, while we learn from them and they're profitable, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So all of the Bible is going to be profitable for us, but we, don't, we only follow the specific instructions that Jesus gives us today, that He speaks to us. So we're not going to build an ark in order to be saved. We're not going to believe that uh, God will make our seed as numerous as the stars in heaven in order to be saved. We're not going to repent and be water baptized in order to be saved. The way we're saved is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin. So what we're going to do tonight, you say, well, how did you figure that out? So that's what we're going to go over tonight. Uh, we had read before, um, a couple weeks ago, and I may, gave the illustration that maybe you have, say, uh, two children, your parents, and you have two children, you have a son, and you have a daughter. And you give different instructions to the son than you give to the daughter, and you have different uh, rewards given to the son or the daughter based on them following the instructions. And that has to do with their different uh, personalities and how they, you know, how they operate. Um, so what will motivate them? What, um, so and what, they, what instructions do they need? So we could give the example... And what we're going to see, you can think of generally, when it comes to your relationship with your parents, uh, you generally have three phases uh, of life that you have. You've got your, um, uh, your child childhood, 
and then maybe the second phase is your teenage years, and then the third phase would be as an adult. So uh, we'll give the illustration, let's say the son here, uh, the son, when he is a child, maybe the instructions you give to the child is um, eat your vegetables, right? He doesn't want to, you know, you have to tell him eat your vegetables. And uh, so eat your vegetables and maybe um, do your homework, okay? Do your homework. Do homework. Now, when that child becomes a teenager, uh, same child, but you don't really have to give him those instructions like that. Maybe, maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But maybe as a teenager, you got different instructions like, um, you know, don't hang out, don't hang out with a gang. Let's say, don't hang out, out with the gang. And uh, the second one, we're just going to say, just for illustration, we're just going to say, um, graduate high school. So those are your different instructions there. Graduate high school. And then when you get to be an adult, uh, again, he's still your son, and you don't really, you're not over him like you would before uh, as far as telling him what to do and what not to do. He's mature enough to do it on his own. But maybe you give him advice on uh, uh, where to live. So you give advice on where to live. And let's say... Um, what job to have, you know, what profession, so what job. So you can see here that when you are a child, the son, uh, the, your parents are still the same parents, but that the instructions will be different when you're, say, eight, nine years old versus uh, when you're a teenager versus when you're an adult. And so uh, then uh, we can have the example of the daughter. And uh, again, with, with, the da with the daughter, you're going to have a similar type thing. You know, as a child, um, maybe her instructions is, you know, something different. Let's say, uh, wash dishes. Help, help mom wash dishes, let's say. And as a teenager, um, maybe it's, uh, don't wear makeup, let's say. Don't wear too much makeup or, uh, or skimpy clothes. Don't wear makeup or skimpy clothes. And, and again, this is just, you know, I'm just making stuff up, but you can see that there would be different things here. Adult, uh, maybe you would give advice on uh, who to marry, let's say. So, we're, I'm just throwing those out there. So, you've got, um, they're still your son, they're still your daughter at these different stages, uh, but there are different instructions at different times, and there'd be different rewards associated with that. So, you can think of it sort of like what Jesus has done with the Bible. You can divide the Bible sort of like that. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. In 1 Corinthians 1, 22, it says that the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So the Jews want the sign and then the Greeks look for wisdom. So since God, God is the one who made us, so he understands how we operate, and so he knows we're looking for different things. So then he's going to give different instructions to the Jews versus giving us different instructions to the Greeks, just like, or Gentiles there. Uh, I'll put that in parentheses. We're Gentiles there. Uh, just like you would have different instructions for the son and for the daughter. You love both your son and your daughter the same. Uh, you want them to do well in life. And because they have different personalities, different things that motivate them, you're going to give them different instructions and different rewards based upon the, where they are in life. And so God made us. Uh, he knows that the Jews require a sign the Greeks seek after wisdom. So it makes sense then that the, that the instructions that God gives or Jesus gives is going to be different uh, based upon if you are a Jew or if you're a Gentile. And it's also going to differ based upon the, the phase that you're in. So, with that in mind then, let's look at uh, first, and we talked last time, we got through, uh, we talked about how God dealt with the Jews first. He started the nation of Israel with Abram in Genesis chapter 12. And what happens is, after a period of 400 years where they are in Egypt, God says, now Israel is ready to be born, basically to be my people. There are approximately two, two million people at this time. And so Jesus gives the instructions there. So the instruction to the, 
we're going to say the Jew represents the son, and I'll just put up here Jew, just give it, and the daughter is going to represent the Greek or the Gentile there. So he starts with the Jews first, and so the instruction that he gives as a child, so the Jew, the instruction he gets as a child is to uh, obey the Mosaic law. And this is something, it is because, spiritually speaking, they are children. They're not believers. Abraham, God says, see the this, this stars and see how numerous they are, so shall your seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 4 through 6. God never tells Abraham, well, here's a law, and I want you to obey this law. And it's because Abraham believed God. If you believe God, you don't need the law. And to show you that, uh, Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24. So we're going to see Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24. It says, Galatians 3, 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So it's important, basically, the law there is a schoolmaster. A schoolmaster, schoolmaster teaches you something. And so once you learn the lesson, you're no longer under that schoolmaster. So if I graduate from college, let's say I go to college, well then I'm under the schoolmaster of the university, and they have people instruct me, the professors and the books, and I take tests and all these things. And if I learn the curriculum, learn what I need to learn from college, then they give me a degree, it says I'm graduated, and so then I'm no longer under the schoolmaster of the college. So the college isn't there really to give me a, a, uh, a way to live, you know, make a lot of money, uh, get along in life. It's really just to teach me some skills, some things that I'll need, and that I can use back out really out in the real world. Uh, that's what a school does. It's a, it's a controlled environment of learning that will, once you learn that, then you can use the skills there to the real world. So applied spiritually, you have Israel, they are in unbelief. Uh, if you look over in Acts chapter 7, uh, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen gives, uh, the, really the Holy Ghost through Stephen, gives an account here of, of what has happened with uh, Israel for their entire history. And, he, you know, we won't read that whole chapter, but he goes... You know, from the beginning with Moses all the way to, uh, to the end here. And he says, here, their whole history is here before him from Abraham to the time of Jesus' ascension and the twelve apostles, the coming of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 7.51, in Acts 7.51, he says, "Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So, uh, this is the issue, is that Israel... The reason they are to obey the Mosaic Law, the reason they're told that, is because Israel is in unbelief. They haven't learned the lesson of the law. Abram learned the lesson of the law. He had the law of the conscience, and he learned that he was a sinner. There was no way to save himself. And so then God says, well, I'm going to give you righteousness if you simply believe that I will make your seed as numerous as the stars in heaven. With Israel, God had said, he said, I'm bringing you out of Egypt, Go into the promised land. That's a type of their eternal life, their kingdom. Uh, God's eter eternal kingdom on earth is going to be that nation of Israel. He says, go into that land, possess it. Um, he doesn't say anything about having to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. He doesn't give them a Mosaic law, a law to follow. He just says, that's the promised land. I give it to you. Go and take it. But they didn't believe. They sent the spies, as God had said. And it wasn't, uh, when they sent the spies, it wasn't for them to say, well, are we strong enough? Are we good enough to take the land? No, the 12 spies were sent to see what kind of battle strategy will we have? How, what does the land look? Where do we attack it? How do we, uh, how do we possess that land? And instead, they came back and said, we can't do it. There are giants in the land. They're bigger than us. And so then God says, well, I see that you don't, you haven't learned the lesson of the law. The law as we saw in Galatians 3.24, was your schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The lesson of the law isn't that I can do it. The lesson of the law, in fact, if you look in Romans 7, 
Romans 7, you're going to find the answer to why God gave the law. You know, just like these rules back here for the child, when you're a child, eat your vegetables, do your homework. Um, those things, you don't really have to do that in order to succeed in life. Um, because when you're an adult, you'll just go to a job and work. Maybe you don't have homework there. Or when you're an adult, you could eat other things other than vegetables. You don't have to do this stuff. But it's really, as a child, there are some lessons that your parents want to instill in you. That you don't eat junk food all of your life because then you won't have good health. So we're going to get you to eat something healthy. And if you do homework, then you realize you can't just sit around and play video games all day. But you've got to work for a living in order to survive. So we're going to give you some homework. So these are just lessons. They're, they're just means to an end. To understand, to have a healthy lifestyle, and to work hard. So then that will help you in life. Or, you know, again, wash dishes. Again, work hard. Or help your parents out. Or, you know, help out the family. Uh, those types of things. Those are instructions that are given, the, the lessons that are trying to instill there. So when God gives Israel the law, remember they're in unbelief. It's not for them to obey the law. It's so that they understand that they cannot obey the law. If the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith, then the law is there to teach you that you cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot have eternal life by you doing good. Uh, you see the lesson of the law in Romans 7, verse 10. Romans 7, verse 10 says, And the commandment... Well, in fact, let's go back to verse uh, 8. Romans 7, 8. But sin, that sin nature within me, taken occasion by the commandment, the law. In this case, it's the law of the conscience. But Israel didn't learn the lesson of the law, so God gave them the Mosaic law. Just like if you've got a son who's not doing what you tell him to do, you've got to come up with stricter guidelines, stricter requirements. So with, when God saw that Israel was in unbelief, then he had to give them a stricter uh, law, a Mosaic law on top of the law of the conscience. Romans 7, 8 says, But sin, my sin nature, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And he's saying, well, why did God do that? Why does God say obey the Mosaic law when, when I get the law, then I'm just going to sin? It says, uh, verse 11, For sin, the sin nature within me, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Well, the reason that God gives you the law isn't so that you will obey the law, because it tells you right there that once the law comes, once the commandment came, then the sin nature works with me so that I sin even more. So it's the law doesn't cause me not to sin. It actually causes me to sin more. And the reason is we need to learn the lesson. The lesson is, verse 12, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Here's the lesson. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. That's the lesson. God gave you Israel the law, the Mosaic law, not so that they would obey it, but so that they would realize they can't obey it. It says there, the lesson of the law is the, the, what they learn then, what they should learn. What they need to learn is the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Sold under sin. That's Romans 7, 14. That's the lesson that God's giving them. Go back to Exodus 19. When God gave the... and By the way, this is Jesus. When I say God, it's Jesus, because Jesus is the Word. Um, let me just show you a neat illustration just as a side so you can see this. Because a lot of times people think, well, when Jesus was on earth and speaking in the red letters, then that's Jesus speaking. But the rest of the Bible is not really. I mean, we call him the Word, but he's not actually speaking. It's like it's, like it's not as important. Um, actually, what we're going to see if we finish it tonight is we're going to see that the words that he speaks through Paul in Romans through Philemon are actually more authoritative from a greater position of power than what he spoke on earth. And uh, hopefully we'll get there tonight. 
Uh, but let me just show you something neat before we go to Exodus 19. Uh, look at Exodus 34. I think Exodus 34 is what I'm wanting here. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it's a. Uh, let me let me just look up a quick reference here. Sorry, sometimes I just something comes to mind and I haven't really prepared for it. But uh, so <laughs> I just look up a quick reference here. Um, okay, uh, Exodus thirty-one. Okay. So in Exodus chapter thirty-one. Notice this, in Exodus 31, Exodus 31 and verse 18, talking about that Mosaic law. So uh, Exodus, and I'll just write it down here, and we'll erase this later, but Exodus 31, 18, talking about the, the uh, Ten Commandments there. It says in Exodus 31, 18, And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, so that's the Ten Commandments. Tables of stone written with the finger of God. So, finger of God. Okay, with that in mind, look over in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, you've got Jesus cast out a devil. And the Pharisees say, well, he does it by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And so here's Jesus' response, Luke 11, 20. And I'm doing this to show you that a lot of times we think of God in Exodus as the Father. And I mean, certainly, I mean, the Father was involved in that, certainly. But if Jesus is the Word, then the Ten Commandments would be from Jesus, since He is the Word. I tell you, and Jesus, by the way, is God. He's God the Son. So he could say that God gave the Ten Commandments, and that could be God the Son, Jesus. Uh, so in Luke 11, here he cast out the devil. They say he does it by the power of the Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Notice what he says in verse 20. Luke 11 and verse 20. Jesus says, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. So it shows that Jesus has. Jesus is the finger of God. Because he uses the finger of God to cast out devils. Look in John 8. Look over in John 8 as well. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, the famous story of the woman caught in adultery. Caught in the very act. The Pharisees bring him to Jesus and says, the law says that she should be stoned. What do you say? Well, if you really read the law, it would show that uh, if anybody is to be stoned, caught in the act of adultery, it is to be the man. Uh, the woman, if it's done in a city, would also be stoned. But if it was in the country, you'd give her the benefit of the doubt and assume that she was raped and so she wouldn't be, she wouldn't be killed. But the man, in all cases, would be killed. If she's caught in the very act of adultery, the man's got to be there. If she's caught in the very act, so why isn't he here? Why is it just the woman? So, you know, Jesus understands this is a setup. And in fact, I personally, I think the man is there. He's one of the Pharisees. Uh, but anyway, so Jesus, they ask, what are you going to do? Well, what should we do? John 8, verse 6. John 8, verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So John 8, verses 6 through 8, we see that Jesus, uh, he stoops on the ground. Jesus writes in the ground. Um, he's writing with his finger. It's the finger of God then. Why do you think he does that? Well, uh, Adam was told, it says uh, in Genesis chapter 2, that uh, God made Adam out of the dust of the ground. And then when he sinned, the curse that Jesus pronounced, uh, God pronounced on him in Genesis chapter 3, 
is uh, for dust thou art, and dust to dust thou shalt return. If Jesus is writing and he is the finger of God and he writes in the dust, does that show that that's what level the Pharisees are at? That they're not acting from the level they should be for God, but they're acting according to their flesh, they're acting according to their sin nature? That's why he writes on the ground? Anyway, but the point is, you can see here, the finger of God is used for the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Jesus uses the finger of God to cast out devils, Luke eleven twenty, And Jesus writes in the ground, of course, with the finger of God, writing in the ground with the dust, which is what they'll be because of their unbelief. They'll, they'll end up uh, dying in their sins. Jesus writes on the ground. So, uh, the point is that don't think of the Ten Commandments as, well, that's God, Jehovah God. But Je uh, Matthew through John is Jesus. And so we follow Jesus in the red letters, but we don't follow Exodus. B. Jesus, John 1, 1 says that Jesus is the Word. So all of that is Jesus. It's just there's a different emphasis, different level that we're at here. And uh, a lot of times they say, well, the vengeful, you know, the Old Testament God is the vengeful God, but the New Testament God is the loving God. Well, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. He's not ever, there's not a single time where he's not love. And in fact, there is more death and violence and wrath of God coming in the book of Revelation than you see God pouring out upon Israel in the Old Testament. Um, so, you know, he wipes, out, he wipes out all those people with the Antichrist. They're all killed. You don't just, with Israel, at least, you know, they got a plague and not all of them died. There was always a remnant that was saved. But uh, when it comes to those who follow the Antichrist, at, the, at Jesus' second coming, he wipes them out. And then after the millennial reign, when Satan is loosed for a little season, all of Satan's army, completely obliterated. Uh, there's a lot more wrath of God poured out. Uh, it says the cup of his wrath poured out without mixture um, in Revelation than there is in uh, the Old Testament. So what we want to see then is get out of this mindset that uh, you've got the vengeful God of the Old Testament, but then Matthew through John is the loving, caring God seen in Jesus. So we see love is a uh, red color of what, Valentine's Day is coming up, February 14th. That's Love Day, Happy Love Day. And they, uh, red's a big color, so we put Jesus' words in red because he's love. Well, absolutely, he's love, but the God of the Old Testament is love as well. Uh, his character doesn't change. It's just, what do you do? When your son won't eat the vegetables and do his homework, you punish him. You don't kill him because you love him, but you punish him. And that's what the God of the Old Testament is doing. He's punishing them so that they understand. They put them under the law, give them punishment, so that they, because they're in unbelief. Notice Exodus 19. Why God gives the Mosaic Law is they're in unbelief. Exodus 19. In Exodus chapter 19, God, Exodus 20 gives you the Ten Commandments, and of course there are a whole a lot of other laws, especially the requirements for building the sanctuary, the temple, and all that, that you'll see in the rest of Exodus. But um, Exodus 19, God's about to give Moses the Mosaic Law. And he tells them, we read verses 5 and 6 when we talked about Israel's program and how God set them to be, have eternal life on the earth and there would be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles to be saved in the millennial reign. We went over that a couple weeks ago. Notice in Exodus 19 and verse 5, it says, Now therefore, this is God talking to Israel, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So the focus is on the kingdom of God coming to earth. That's why the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Come where? From heaven to earth. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. So he says, all the earth is mine. Verse 6. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Speaking unto Israel. Now remember the lesson of the law according to Romans 7.14 is that I cannot work my way to heaven. I cannot earn eternal life because the law is spiritual and I am carnal. 
So the moment you give me a rule, then I am going to break it because my sin nature thinks, oh, that's a new way I can sin. That's why I've said before, these sexual harassment trainings that they do at work, I've been a government employee for 23 years. Now, it's just a bunch of bunk. You know, why are you telling me? You're going to tell me all these cases of how somebody sexually harassed somebody and my sin nature says, that sounds like a good idea. I never thought of that. I think I'll do that. That's what your sin nature says. I was uh, out Sunday today. We were out shopping somewhere and it said something about don't open up these, I forget what product it was. I wish I could remember, but it was some kind. It said basically, don't open up the product and look at it inside. I guess inspect it because, you know, now it's not new anymore. It's been open. And the first thing my sin nature says, well, why not? Well, I want to know what's inside now. I better open it. You see, that, that's what it is. The law isn't there to get you to obey it. The moment I'm given a law, I learn that I disobey it. I'm carnal. You tell your kid back here as a child, don't touch the stove. It's hot. First thing he does, he touches the stove. Ow, it's hot. I told you not to touch it. See, he wasn't even thinking of touching the stove, but you gave him a rule. His sin nature says, oh, I can do what I want to do, and you touch the stove. So the point of the law isn't for you to obey it. The point is for you to let, learn that I am carnal, that I cannot obey it, and the law is spiritual. Therefore, I need God to save me. The, the law is there to teach us, as I said in Galatians 3.24, to bring us unto Christ. The law teaches us Law teaches us to believe the gospel. To believe the gospel. That I am carnal, that there's nothing I can do no matter how hard I try to earn eternal life, to pay for my sins. And so I need to trust that Jesus, for us today, Jesus died, was buried, and rose again as atonement for my sin. But what does Israel do? God gives the law to Israel Verse 7 now, Exodus 19, 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before the fa their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. Verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Exodus 19, 8 shows that Israel is, un is in unbelief. Israel isn't trusting in God to save them. Exodus 19.8 shows that Israel is self-righteous. Self-righteous. They have not learned the lesson of the law. That's why God gives the Mosaic law. They haven't learned the law of the conscience, so God gives them the Mosaic law. And when you get to the book of Matthew, look over in Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, you'll see that they are still self-righteous in Matthew 19. Their entire history 2,000 years has passed uh, since God started the nation with Abraham. And we're over here in Matthew 19, and it's basically the same response that they gave back in Exodus 19 when God gave the law 1,500 years prior with Moses. Matthew 19, there's the rich young ruler. Verse 16, Matthew 19, 16. Matthew 19, 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? Wrong answer. Matthew 19, 16. What good thing shall I do? Shall I do? He's still self-righteous, just like they were 1,500 years before in Exodus 19, 8. That's why Acts 7, 51 said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. The Holy Ghost has given the law to teach them that they are carnal, sold under sin. To believe the gospel, they refuse to do that. And for their entire history, their mindset, when Jesus is here, is the same as it was when Moses was here. Israel was self-righteous. Exodus 19, 8. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Matthew 19, 16. What good thing shall I do? Verse 17. Jesus said unto him. Matthew 19, 17. He said unto him. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. In other words, he's trying to say, wait a minute. You think you're good because you're self-righteous. You think you could do something good to get eternal life. Don't you understand that there is none good, only God is good? 
If you understood the lesson of the law that you are carnal sold under sin, you would not be asking me what good things shall I do. You would understand that you're a sinner bound for help. Because there's only one that's good, that's God. You would go to God for the answer. You would say, God, what's the good news? What's the gospel that I can believe in order to have eternal life? And he says unto him there, Why callest thou me good? Matthew 19, 17. There is none good but one that is God, but... If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. You say, now wait a minute here. You just told me there's none good that is except one that's God, and he's not God. We understand we're carnal, the law is spiritual. Well, how can I keep the commandments? That's the lesson that Jesus is trying to show him. He's not telling him that you will earn eternal life if you keep the commandments. What he's telling him here is that why don't you try it? You say that there's a good thing I can do to have eternal life. So if you want a good thing, I'll give you the list. Keep the commandments. And if you can keep those commandments perfectly, then you have eternal life. And the proper response is, I can't. No matter how hard I try, no matter how good I am, oh good, remember there's none good but one that is God, I am carnal, I'm going to mess up every time. So I need God to save me. The law is your schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ that you might be justified by faith. So God gives the rich young ruler the law so that he may understand that it's justify, justification by faith is how he'll be saved, not by him doing the works. Verse 18, he saith unto him, which? Which commandments? So Jesus gives them the list that involves his relationship with man rather than the relationship with God, which are the last uh, six commandments. Uh, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, do those. Verse, nine, verse 20, the young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? You gotta be kidding me. Really, you've kept all of these commandments. Every time. So whatever your father and mother told you as a child, you did it every single time. Whenever your neighbor got mad at you and did things against you, you loved him and you had no animosity toward your neighbor. Um, you never committed adultery and murder. You say, well, yeah, I've never killed anybody. I've never uh, committed adultery. Well, okay. You say that, go to Matthew chapter 5. Go over to Matthew chapter 5. Sin isn't a physical thing. Sin is in the heart. What, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Your sin occurs in your heart. That's why for you to be saved. That's why the gospel isn't go and do a bunch of good works. The gospel for today is trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. That means in my heart I believe. I recognize that I'm a sinner, and I recognize that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection pays for my sin and gives me eternal life. And so my belief in my heart overcomes my self-righteousness by me recognizing my sin, and by saying, I'm just going to believe, what I'm doing is I'm trusting in God to save me rather than my own works. That's why that saves me. Belief in my heart saves me just like sin in my heart condemns me to hell. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, verse 21, Matthew 5, 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So the commandment, according to Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 21 through 22, the commandment is thou shalt not kill. And what Jesus just said there, he said at the end of that verse there, if I call someone a fool, I'm in danger of hellfire. So the way that I disobey the commandment, thou shalt not kill, according to what Jesus says, is that I say in my heart, thou fool. So thou shalt not kill. That doesn't mean that I, you know, because I could say, honestly, that I have never physically killed somebody. I've never, I've never broken that commandment. I've never taken out a gun, shot anybody. I never stabbed them with a knife never even tried to do those things. But, have I said, have I hated my brother 
angry with my brother without a cause. And I say, thou fool. In other words, what an idiot. You are such a stupid idiot. You know, I'm thinking that in my mind. As I think that in my mind, according to this verse, I disobey, thou shalt not kill. So all I have to do is call somebody a fool in my heart. And I have broken that commandment there. You go down to verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. I was married for 11 years. I tell you that I never committed physical adultery. I never kissed another woman. I never did anything whatsoever physically to break the commandment. But verse 28 says, I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So did I do that? Yeah, I did that. I looked after a woman with lust in my heart, and so I committed adultery in my heart against my wife, even though I never went out on a date with anybody, never kissed anybody, never had sex with anybody. I was completely physically faithful to my wife. I still committed adultery against her in my heart. So it's a heart issue. So thou shalt not kill, physically speaking, I've obeyed it. Thou shalt not commit adultery, physically speaking, I've obeyed it. But in my heart, I've disobeyed both of those. Well, how do I do it? How do I have salvation then? How do I obey that law? He says in verse 20, Matthew 5, verse 20. Now, the Pharisees were the most righteous people as far as religion was concerned. They were seen as perfect people by, by the average Jew. Matthew 5, 20, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying in Matthew 5, 20 is you take the most righteous person you can think of. Say, Mother Teresa, when, I, when she was alive. You know, she's the one that's feeding the poor and, you know, seems very devout and everything. Or let's say the Pope. Or let's say, if you want to say Billy Graham. Or you want to say, um, you know, whoever, Charles Stanley. Whoever, it doesn't matter. Anybody, whoever you think of as your standard of, this is about the most holy, righteous person I've ever known. If your righteousness does not exceed theirs, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So how do you do it? Jesus gives the answer in Matthew 5.48. Matthew 5.48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So if you want to earn righteousness on your own, you just obey the law perfectly every single time, not just physically speaking, but in your heart as well. So not for one second did you ever lust after a member of the opposite sex. Not for one second did you ever have hatred against somebody without a cause. You know, all those people that cut you off and do crazy things when you're driving, you never ever had any hatred whatsoever against any of those people at any time in your entire life. Not a single bad thought against anybody ever. If you do that, then you're perfect, just like your Father in, in heaven is perfect, and you've earned salvation. But of course, none of us have done that, so that's why uh, Romans 3.28, or 3.23, Romans 3.23, all have sinned. So the lesson of the law is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the law is your schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ. Now remember, they're children. Now we talked last time about the, uh, because when you get to Matthew, you're going to see there's a little change in how God operates. Um, and that was, we talked last time about the Jewish plan. And so what you've got here, going back to our little illustration, is you can consider from the time that Israel comes out of Egypt, God gives that Mosaic law. So for the Jew, for the child, the time that they are the children would be from uh, Moses, Moses, uh, we're going to say Moses to Malachi. Basically, the start with Moses, that Mosaic law, all the way to the end of the Old Testament, they are considered children. And then the teenage area for the Jew, and I'm just going to circle the Jew and then the Moses to Malachi, just so it'll stand out from the rest of it here. Now the teenage time, and I'm going to erase one of these just so we have room for it here. Doesn't get messed up with our with the illustration. 
uh, the teenage years for the Jew would be uh, Matthew, Matthew through Acts chapter 7. And you say, wait a minute, we saw in Matthew 19 uh, that they are still self-righteous, just like they were in Exodus 19. Uh, we see in Acts 7, we read Acts 7, 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So they have not learned the lesson. The lesson, eat your vegetables, do your homework. That child is now a teenager. They're still doing the, the bad stuff. They're still not obeying you. What's changed? Well, what's changed is they, they're older now. You know, whether they obey what you tell them to do or not, they're going to get older. That's, you know, assuming they're still alive. They're going to get older. And they're going to grow up. They'll go through puberty. And things are going to change with their body and their minds and different things because they'll be in a different stage of life. So the rules that you give as a teenager are different from what you give as a child. Whether, whether they obeyed you as they were a child or not, you're still going to alter the rules that you give them as a teenager because their mind is different. It's, it's maturing, it's different thoughts. You know, as a, as a child, the son never thought of girls. If they would thought of girls, they thought they had cooties and you stay away from them. But by the time the son is a teenager, now he wants to be around girls and likes them, wants to go out on dates. Uh, girls didn't change, they're still girls. It's just uh, the, the mind of the child changes once he reaches puberty, once he gets to a teenage year. So spiritually speaking, you can think of Israel here in Moses through Malachi. And then the teenage years is Matthew through Acts 7. Now the reason I say that is because what we went over last time with the Daniel 70 weeks, the timeline. The timeline there shows that, um, that we talked about that out of those, you've got the 483 of the 490 years prophesied in Daniel chapter 9 end, and then the Messiah is crucified. Then there is some things that have to happen, and then there is a seven-year covenant that Israel makes with the Antichrist, and that's the tribulation period. And then after the tribulation period, Jesus comes back and sets up God's kingdom on earth. We went over that. I think it was last week. We went over that. So, once the child reaches puberty, his body starts changing. He's still just the rebellious one. He wouldn't eat his vegetables. He won't do his homework. You tell him don't hang out with the gang, and he's hanging out with the gang. He's getting involved in drugs. He's doing all this bad stuff. Uh, but you change what you tell him because his mind has changed, but he's still just as rebellious as before. And that's what's going on with Israel. So that's why when you get to Matthew, the reason it changes here, and people say, well, this is Jesus, the loving and caring uh, God here. And so you, they think that's for us today, the red letters. But really, it's just a continuation of Israel's program. As we talked about last time in Daniel 9, once the Messiah, once 483 of the 490 years of Israel's final time there before the kingdom is set up, that's when the Messiah is going to be crucified. Now, when John the Baptist, he is born six months before Jesus. And when John is around age 30, he starts preaching what you see in Matthew 3. Go over to Matthew chapter 3. So if you are, according to the prophetic timeline of, of Daniel here, and I'm going to uh, write this, uh, I'm going to erase this and write it down here at the bottom. So according to the prophetic timeline of Daniel, uh, you've got when the Messiah, and this is according to Daniel 9.27, in 27, is that right? Let me go back to that. Probably before that, it's probably verse 26. Yeah, Daniel 9.26. According to Daniel 9.26, there are seven years left. Seven years left. Seven years left uh, when Messiah is crucified. When Messiah is crucified. Now, back up from his crucifixion, Jesus' earthly ministry starts around age 30. Luke 3 tells us that. And that would have been about three and a half years before his crucifixion. 
John the Baptist was born six months before him. John the Baptist ministry also starts at age 30 because that's when the, when the priest would start. So that would bring you to about four years before this. So at the time of Matthew 3, where are we are in the timeline? So there's seven years left when Messiah is crucified, say left uh, before, uh, before Jesus comes and sets up God's kingdom on earth. So when you are in Matthew 3, then you back up four years. So now there's 11 years left when John the Baptist comes. When John the Baptist comes. So what that means, again, they're still just as rebellious in Matthew as they were in Exodus. But the difference is, now they're a teenager. In other words, they're almost entering the kingdom. They're almost at adulthood. Because in that history, when God started with Moses back 1,500 years ago, there is only 11 years left before God is going to set up his kingdom on earth. So you better get it right. Just like when you're a teenager, you could be just rebel as rebellious as before. But, you know, if you did something really bad as a teenager, say 15, 16 years old, well, you go to juvenile hall and uh, you'd be punished there. But you do the exact same thing, whatever it is, when you're 18, just a couple years later. And now you don't go to juvenile hall. You go to the big house, the prison, the jail, the pokey, whatever you want to call it. And it's going to be a lot worse punishment there than it is as a child. Same thing with Israel. When God sets up his kingdom on earth, Jesus' second coming, he's going to come. And if they've aligned themselves with the Antichrist, they're going to hell. There isn't a chance for them to say, oh, please forgive me. No, no chance at that point. They've taken the mark. They worship the image of the beast. They follow the Antichrist. They're going to hell. So you do the bad things when you're a child, your punishment's not as bad. As a teenager, it's worse. Once you hit 18, though, you better have your act together because you're going to be in serious trouble with the law if you do really bad stuff. You may be in jail all your life for doing one stupid thing when you're 18, whereas if you did it when you're 15, it wouldn't be as big of a deal, the punishment. So you can think of Israel like that. When you get to Matthew 3, it's about time. Only 11 years until uh, Jesus is going to come back and set up God's kingdom on earth. And if they haven't believed the gospel, they're going to hell. So that's why it says, Matthew 3, Matthew 3, verse 2. Matthew 3, verse 2. He says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist says, kingdom is at hand. That's because there's just 11 years. 11 years till the kingdom's going to be on the earth. So the at hand phase of the kingdom here. Kingdom at hand. 11 years before the kingdom comes. Six months later. So the first thing you see coming out of John the Baptist's mouth when he starts his ministry in Matthew 3, 2 is repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4 Matthew 4, verse 17. Matthew 4, verse 17. Six months later, this is Jesus speaking. And what does he say? From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The exact same message Jesus gives, Matthew 4, 17, as John gave in Matthew 3, 2. You go back to Malachi or any of those prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, all those names there, you go through that, you will not see repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because Malachi, probably the last book written in your Old Testament, was written approximately 400 years before John and Jesus were born. So the kingdom isn't at hand yet. You still got 400 years plus another 30 or so before and then another seven on top of that you might as well say you're about 440 years away when malachi is written you're about 440 years away from the kingdom but when john starts preaching you only got 11 years left and when jesus starts preaching you only got 10 and a half years left so here 10 and a half years left then you get to acts 2 acts 2 and now You've, Jesus has been crucified, so now you're down to seven years left. According to Daniel's timeline, you only got seven years left. 
So what's the message here? Acts 2, verse 38. Acts 2, verse 38. Acts 2.38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So in order for you to be saved, when you're at, if you're living in the time of Acts chapter 2, there's only seven years left. So the way you're saved is repent and be baptized. That is the same message that John call, started. That's why he's called John the Baptist. You say, well, why do you call him John the Baptist? Well, because he started baptizing. You don't see people doing that before then. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they did not say, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You do not see any record of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, those people ever water baptizing anybody. But they had to do that here in Acts 2 and in Matthew 3. Why is that? Well, the instructions changed. If you've got a rebellious child, when he's a child, you tell him, eat your vegetables, do your homework. When he's a teenager, you understand that he can get a lot more trouble now. You know, if he doesn't eat his vegetables and do his homework, well, now maybe he grows up to be unhealthy and uh, he's a lazy bum. But if he doesn't hang out with a gang, I mean, if he gets involved with gangs, well, now he could get involved in drug deals, killing people. I mean, there are a whole lot of worse things you can do as a teenager than you could as a child. So the rules, you got to wrap up the rules here. Give them some, you know, give them some responsibility. Let them understand that your actions have consequences to them. So when you're back there in the Old Testament, God says, obey the Mosaic law. And the reason he said that wasn't so that they would obey it, but so that they would realize that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal. The law teaches them to believe the gospel. What's the gospel there? The gospel is trust in God to save you. They didn't really know the, uh, the, the reasoning behind that yet. It was not revealed yet. So they said trust in God to save you. But when you get, you notice baptism here. So repent and be baptized. Why do you get baptized? Verse 40, Acts 2, 40. Acts 2, 40. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. The reason they need to be water baptized is remember from Exodus 19 is God says you are going to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles. And that happens in the millennial reign. The millennial reign happens after God's kingdom comes in, uh, at, at uh, Jesus' second coming. So when you're here in Matthew, when you're here in Matthew, you got 11 years left when John the Baptist preaches, you got ten and a half years left when Jesus preaches, and you got only seven years left in Acts 2.38. That's a real short timeline. So there wasn't this building of the kingdom of priests. Go back and you can see, uh, the, here's why water baptism is preached there in Matthew and in Acts, but it's not preached before them. Uh, go to Exodus um, What chapter do I want in Exodus? Um, is it 27? Is it 28? Maybe it's 28? Maybe it's 29. I think it's 29. Yes, Exodus 29. Exodus 29, it says, Israel had 12 tribes. The Levites were the priestly tribe. And in Exodus 29, you've got Aaron. He was of that tribe. He was the first high priest, if you want to call him that, of Israel. Technically, Melchizedek is Jesus's. But anyway, um, man, um, high priest Aaron. Exodus 29, verse 4. Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall wash them with water. So who's getting baptized in Exodus 29, verse 4? It's the Levites. So in Exodus, that's when they're a child under the Mosaic Law, in Exodus 29.4, it says that the Levites are baptized. But the other 11 tribes of Israel are not water baptized. When you get down here to Matthew, everybody who repents and trusts in God to save them 
they're water baptized. Well, whatever tribe you're of, it doesn't matter. So why the change? Well, because Israel, according to Exodus 19.6, is supposed to be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles. Let me, uh, let me put that here because we're running out of room over here. So in, um, so Israel is supposed to be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. That's in the millennial reign. So when you're in, when you're in Matthew, you're 11 years away of John the Baptist, 10 and a half with Jesus, seven years away in Acts. And once that time is over, the end of the seven-year tribulation period, Jesus comes back, his second coming. And then Jesus sets up God's kingdom on earth. Revelation 21. Um, tells you, about Revelation 20. Revelation 20 talks about how there is a, Revelation 20, verse 2, verse 4, and verse uh, 6. In fact, let's look in Revelation 20, verse 6. That'll be the clearest for, well, for our purposes. Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed is and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So it says that Israel is going to be priests of God, and that fulfills Exodus 19.6 to be a kingdom of priests. So they are priests of God for 1,000 years. And what they do is they go out to the Gentiles, and they give them the Mosaic Law. And then the, they hear that Mosaic Law, and that's to teach them, and then they are to go up to Jerusalem where the Messiah is, the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's ruling and reigning on the earth there. And then they're taught of him. And then they, um, at the end of the millennial reign, they have their opportunity to believe and be saved, to have eternal life as well. Uh, see that over in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, a prophecy of that millennial reign. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, verses 2 and 3. Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3. So Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, Isaiah 2, 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. So that's telling you God has set up, Jesus has set up God's kingdom on earth for the millennial reign here. And it says, and all nations shall flow unto it. So all the Gentiles. Many people, verse 3, many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So Isaiah 2, 2 3, verses 2 and 3 shows that Gentiles learn the law learn the law in Jerusalem where Jesus Christ is. They learn the law there. And Israel then is a priest of God for those thousand years. So according to God's timeline, when John the Baptist appears, they are only 11 years away from the time when they are to be, Jesus is going to come back, they are going to be priests of God, and they then are going to go to the Gentiles to teach them the law. So they have to be water baptized because the priests are ordained uh, as priests, according to Exodus 29, uh, verse 4, uh, by water baptism. Now, you have, back then, only the Levites were baptized because they're back here in this child phase. So, you know, what do you do here when you're talking about the child and the teenager? So I talked about the rebellious child. And when he gets to a teenager, now you're starting to get nervous. Because now if, he, if he's still rebellious, he's going to get into some real trouble. But you may have, let's say the daughter here. She's good, let's say. She obeys you. Uh, she reads her books. She does her homework. She does everything she's supposed to do. So what do you do with her? You're not telling her, don't hang out with the gang. If she's the real good girl then maybe you put her in AP classes, honor classes. She takes, uh, 
She could take college classes. She may be able to complete a four-year uh, college program in a year and a half or two years because she took college courses while she was in high school. It's like she was a step ahead. She was mature. She was believing what you told her. She did what you told her to do. She worked hard. And so now she's more prepared. So what God did with Israel is he says, I've got these 12 tribes, and what we do is the Levites, they're going to be baptized. They're the ones that are going to set the example. They're the good child. You say, why the Levites? Why were they chosen? Well, what happened was Israel was in rebellion, and God says, I'm going to, they were worshiping on a golden calf, and uh, they were, uh, and basically Moses says, who is on the Lord's side? Let them come unto me. The Lord's going to wipe you guys out because you're worshiping uh, idols here. In the presence of God, God just appeared on Mount Zion, gave the commandments and the law to Moses, and now you're, you're down here worshiping idols, this golden calf, so God's going to wipe you out. Who's going to stand with me? The Levite stood up and says, we'll stand with you. We're on the Lord's side. So because the Levites made that choice at that time, God separates out the Levites as the priestly tribe. And he says, priests are to be water baptized. And the reason is because the Mosaic law is a fleshly covenant. So the water baptism purifies you in the flesh. And so they're water baptized there. Because they, they said we're on the Lord's side. Just like the daughter, if she's the one who is a good girl and does everything you say, then while the, teen, while the son is a teenager and you're hoping he doesn't hang out with gangs and start killing people and dealing drugs and you just hope he gets through high school, the daughter, not only is she going to get through high school, but she's already taken two years of college courses while she's in high school. She's, she's doing what she's supposed to do. So she's ahead of the game. So that's why the Levites were water baptized. They're ahead of the game. Uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the tribes are in idolatry. The Levites say, I'm on the Lord's side. I'll stand with you, Moses. I, what do you want me to do? So they're the good people, so then they're water baptized. But by the time you get to age 18 here, whether the son is rebellious or not, it's time to go out in the real world. He's got to be ready. So when you know, he gets to be maybe 16 or 17, then you're looking at, well, we got to get you graduate from high school. And you keep, so now we go take you to a, um, what is it, continuation school? I think that's what they used to call it. I don't know if they still call it that. Uh, we need to get you prepared to take your GED or your high school proficiency exam. You didn't take the courses, so we, we just got to get that diploma somehow. So we're going to get you to take the GED course and get you to study for that. You goofed off all this other time. We at least get you to do that. Basically, when you get to Matthew through Acts, because of their unbelief, Matthew through Acts 7 is basically Israel's remedial program. It is, you never believe me, but like it or not, you're almost 18. The kingdom is coming in 11 years. When you get to Peter, it's coming in 7 years. So whether you've been goofing off like the son or you're doing good like the daughter, either way, the kingdom is coming. And because you're in unbelief, I'm putting you under this remedial program. You need to repent. The problem is you're self-righteous. I erased that, but you're still in unbelief. Acts 7, 51, Israel's still in unbelief. So you need to repent and be baptized in order to be saved. Uh, you say, well, the baptism is only for the priestly tribe, the Levites. Yeah, but the kingdom's coming in seven years when you're in Acts chapter 2. So like it or not, you're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, Revelation 20, verse 6, to, uh, to the Gentiles for a thousand years. So like it or not, let's get going here. It's repent, stop trusting in your own righteousness, trust in God's righteousness to save you, and be water baptized. That's why you've got the Sermon on the Mount. We got to wrap it up. I'm sorry, I'm over. I get excited about this stuff and the time flies. In Matthew 5, churchianity looks at Matthew 5 and says, well, we got to do all this stuff. These are the commandments for God. That's not for you today. The reason is you're not in the remedial program. If you've trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, you're adopted as a child of God. This is where you are, where you're a Gentile. You are an adult now. You're not a teenager. You're not a child. You are an adult. So you have adult responsibilities. You've already learned the lesson of the law to bring you unto Christ that you might be justified. You've already learned this. Therefore, you are an adult and you can handle adult things. 
So he doesn't put you under the law, he puts you under grace. But Israel, when you get to Matthew, that's not, a Sermon on the Mount is not adults' instructions. That's the remedial program. Because Israel says in Matthew 19, the rich young ruler, all these things have I kept since my youth up. And Jesus in his mind saying, you are just so deceived. You think in your own righteousness. In Luke 18, the Pharisee says, I thank God that I am not like this publican. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of all that I possess. In other words, I'm not an extortioner. I'm not like other people. I'm a righteous person. I'm a good person. Look at what I do. That's the attitude of Israel. And so when Jesus tells them in Matthew 5, he's not telling them, you got to obey the Ten Commandments. He's telling them, you don't understand. You think you've never killed. You think you've never committed adultery. But I say unto you, if you have hatred in your, toward your brother without a cause, or you just say, you stupid idiot, thou fool, basically what it's saying, you're in danger of hell fire. You just killed that person in your heart. You don't think you ever committed adultery? You lusted after that woman for 2.3 seconds when she walked by. You just committed adultery in your heart. I know you didn't physically do it, but in your heart you did it. In other words, what Jesus is doing is he's amplifying the Mosaic law so that they understand you need to be saved. You're not righteous. In ten and a half years from the time of the Sermon on the Mount, you're supposed to be a priest of God for a thousand years, and you are stuck here with these problems. So I'm putting you, Israel, in this remedial program, in this crash course, basically, to get your GED, to, to graduate. It's repent and be baptized. That's the crash course. It's change your mind. Repent means change your mind. Stop trusting in your own righteousness, trusting God to save you. Get water baptized to save yourself from this untoward generation, to graduate from the remedial program. And then you'll be ready, ten and a half years from now, to be a priest of God for a thousand years. So anyway, we're way over. I apologize, but uh, we'll, we'll just have to pick up here next time. Didn't get nearly as far as I wanted to. But uh, hopefully you can see that when you are in... What changes in Matthew isn't that the program has changed. God is still talking to the Jew, and we talked about that last time. It's just now they're no longer a child as they were in Moses through Malachi. They are a teenager, and they are rebellious. Therefore, Matthew through Acts 7 is the remedial program for the Jew to get on board to be a king or a priest for God for a thousand years in the millennial reign. That's where they are. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for sending your Son to die on a cross for our sins. We thank you that once we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, you give us the gift of eternal life. You see this together with Christ in the heavenly places. And you give us your Holy Spirit. You give us God's completed, perfect, preserved Word in a King James Bible. You give us the mind of Christ to apply it. You give us the Holy Ghost to teach it to us. Help us, Lord, to see all these tools that we have spiritually, to use them, to read and believe your word, rightly divided, to apply the, the words that are read, given by Jesus to us, found in Romans through Philemon, so that we may bring glory to you and have Christ living in us, his life in us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.